All right, we, so we're going to talk about R squared in, in depth now. So there's there's the there's the relevance data uh, there from the frontline setting that showed a large international randomized trial that that was designed to be superior. Um, that the, the R squared was to, to chemotherapy. It turns out that it was basically equivalent. Um, I know that in some people in the in the U.S., I've heard some people get up and say, "Well, now that's my standard frontline therapy." There's the augment data um, that that shows. In, as you mentioned, Matt, it, that it was in the, the rituximab sensitive patients, you know, comparing R squared to, to R. Um, well, one, one, is anybody, do you, st you know, it sounds like most of us are using, still using chemoimmunotherapy as frontline, but um, is anybody using R squared standardly as frontline therapy at this time? No, I'm not, it, it, but I will say it's an appealing option in the right patients in the frontline. Uh, I think that, you know, you're, you do have a patient population who's perhaps a little more frail, unfit, that you would normally treat with, with uh, rituximab alone, perhaps. And based on the relevance trial, even though it didn't show uh, any advantage to giving R-squared over chemotherapy, it actually showed that R-squared is probably just as good. And the data was quite impressive in that way. And so I asked myself a lot of times, if I'm going to give single-agent rituximab in that setting, and frontline setting in particular here, why wouldn't I, add, do I have a reason that I'm not going to add lenalidomide to it or not? I will say that uh, you have to really step back and say these rashes can be very problematic. I mean, I, I think we all see that. Or other problems that can happen with the Revlimid. So it's not for everybody just because you can do it, right? We have to recognize this is not a curative regimen. We're talking about people that are in their 70s or 80s perhaps where we're thinking about this. Um, and so what's the bang for the buck, so to speak? What's the, what, what are we really going to get out of it? And sometimes I think it's very, very uh, reasonable to do, and other times I think it's not as reasonable to do. I think costs can, can factor into that when there's, you know, not a survival advantage, you know, very similar, uh, and, and I think, believe it was 18 months uh, of lenalidomide. It uh, um, so it's not, a, it's not six months of lenalidomide. And let's not... Yes, yeah, it's more than one year, so it's Let's not ever time. forget copays on patients. It's yeah. something that we don't really absorb and think about, but it's something we should be paying attention to. So, so maybe for the select patient, but not for every patient frontline, but Pia Luigi, you brought up the subject you're, you're about it in the second line. So you're, you're uh, quite taken with, uh, with the augment data, the, the randomized trial? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the data really, as I said before, uh, square uh, for relapsed refractory patient uh, is a very good uh, uh, chemo-free regimen. This is very important. It's, a, the, it's the first time there is an advent of chemo-free regimen with an, an immunomodulant lenalidomide and an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody rituximum. The data are really good in terms of clinical response with a very low uh, toxicity and could be, and I think it will, will be the, the, the best second line treatment for our patient with follicular lymphoma. As I said before, we are waiting only in Europe for the hemo official indication because we are uh, six, uh, eight months later of uh, FDA as usual. But I think uh, it's a real uh, uh, good combination uh, and uh, Probably in the future, we can try to combine with another drug, like a triplet, to increase uh, the, the clinical response, the efficacy without any kind of cumulative tox toxicity. Why not with uh, other new biological agents? So there are several uh, phase one, phase two studies concerning uh, to include uh, another agent uh, to r square. Matt, you brought up a really important point about the design of the augment trial, which was basically you had to be appropriate for single agent rituximab to be entered onto that trial. And so there's a population of patients that um, that that's that you're probably not going to want to use that in, right? Yeah, I, I, you know, people who can't get access to it because they can't afford uh, the upfront cost to to get onto lenalidomide, I think would be the the first population. Um, you know, from I, I, having used it in the maintenance setting in multiple myeloma, uh, um, you know, so I'm not too afraid of the, the, the DVT risks. I think there's something to say about having uh, steroid plus lenalidomide uh, from, that, from that standpoint. But I think it is a, an investment in potential, you know, rash uh, does come out. Cytopenias is definitely there. And I think that you have to be on, on guard for, uh, 
uh, dose reductions and dose holds. Um, you know, this, the, the cytopenias are very responsive to growth factor and, and dosing holds, but, you know, respect those uh, and don't press the envelope in a disease where, you know, the goal is to, you know, quality of life for as long as possible, uh, rather than pushing through uh, at doses that they're not necessarily going to tolerate. And again, I think it comes back to what we said earlier. A lot of these people will do uh, very well with great efficacy at lower doses. So I have a very low threshold to dose reduce, and frankly, I start patients at a lower dose because of those reasons. What about the group of people um, that that are you know the early progressors, people that you're particularly worried about, right? Um, that that uh, you know maybe they they relapse within you know six or nine or a year after. Um, after frontline therapy, John, are you gonna you're gonna use R squared in that re in those group of people? You probably wouldn't give them single agent rituxan. We'd no, I'm not going to give them single agent rituximab, but I am going to give them R squared. Um, I think uh, I think the regimen is impressive in those patients. I'm, uh, I would say it's not a home run. They're still going to end up doing worse than somebody who has long remissions from upfront therapy. But I like the idea of doing something that's not normally the same type of chemotherapy or, or close to it that they got before. I think R-squared is really going to become the major standard of care in second line treatment even for more aggressive patients. So I'll say that I would hope that they uh, would uh, potentially be at a center that had the SWOG study open, which has an arm, which is obinutuzumab, lenalidomide, in, in that patient in population. But I know that that's not going to happen uh, um, for, every, for everybody. But uh, that's a good point. I think we should yeah. really stress that's something we haven't talked about. And those kinds of patients, those are the patients we should be thinking about clinical trial for especially, right? I, I, I mean, we all want to say everybody should be on a trial. Uh, very few patients go on a trial, but the ones that really need a trial are those ones, and we should never th never forget about that. Yeah. And you have to remember that the, the historical data by Michael Wan concerning the role of R square also in a diffuse B-cell lymphoma. So I mean, for aggressive uh, uh, follicular lymphoma, you can use R square because yes. it's quite active. Actually, also there's an abstract of patients. There's an abstract uh, at ASH. I mean, transformed follicular lymphoma uh, has a pretty decent response rate. I know the PFS is is uh, uh, not quite short, but it's but in that in that disease, it's going to be a bridge to something. Sure.